warm welcome in Jesus' name to our service of worship this morning. It's great to see people on this fresh, cool morning. You can't hear me at the back? Okay, let's try again. Can you hear me now? Not quite? No, no. Any better? Testing, testing. One, two, three. It's a good job this is just a rehearsal. We'll be fine when it comes to the actual service. We're okay. Testing, testing. Testing, testing, one, two, three. No. Okay. Shall I come and get the lapel mic? Is that any better? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes? yes. Good. Okay. Good morning. Welcome, in Jesus' name, to our service of worship. Um, isn't it cold out? Yes. What a beautiful morning. Yeah. It's great to see everyone. Uh, those joining us online, it's great to have you joining us either live this morning or later in the week. It's good to have you join us. Um, there's uh, just a couple of notices to give this morning. The first is a note of congratulations to Chris and Jane Aslett on the safe arrival of their granddaughter. Those who've seen the name of their granddaughter may be wondering how you pronounce it. Now, I'm not going to say I'm going to get this right. Anatswa? That's just the first part. I'm not even going to try this. Nearly right? We're not really sure. <laughs> You're not sure? Okay. okay. Safe arrival. Congratulations. And then the other notice is just to remind people that on Sunday the 14th, so that's next week, we've got our church meeting after the morning service. It's only a short church meeting, so at the end of the service we'll get refreshments and then we'll gather back together um, after we've had a tea and coffee. Okay. So I'm going to give a, a call to worship and after that Sue and the band are going to lead us in a couple of songs and a time of open prayer and then Martin will come and share in, the, in our mission slot for this morning. Let's come to our call to worship. Lord, as we've gathered to worship you, we bring all that we are this morning. Tired, energetic, sad, happy, grief stricken or filled with hope. We come as we are, in the hope that you will take all that we offer and transform it into something greater than the sum of its parts. May the wind of your spirit gather our worship and lift it on high, that you would be glorified. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Harvard Street, etc. And this is just my name's Martin Harvey, I'm a church member. <coughs> and um, today I'm up here as part of the Mission Action Group uh, to bring you up to date on our Baptist Missionary Society, BMS for short, Link Missionaries, Michelle and Dave Ma, or Mahon as Dave announces it. We can discuss this because Michelle also just said Ma. And personally, I think Marl is technically correct because uh, it's an Irish name. Um, Dave's family traces back to the Caribbean to the families of African and Irish slaves. And Michelle's family traces back to um, its history back to Nigeria. Um, coming from a business background, um, Michelle and Dave were both Baptist ministers and they were in ministry for four years in uh, South East London before moving to Peru. Uh, they're now in their second five-year commitment to uh, BMS. And in 2017, allowed to take only what they could pack in suitcases, so think of it like a reverse Paddington. <laughs> yeah. um, and taking Jonathan, Phoebe, and Ruth, who were seven, four, and two at the time, they moved Peruvian Amazon to Iquitos, a city that can only be reached by plane or boat. No roads. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in Iquitos, they learned the language, Spanish, uh, homeschooled the children, and established the Norte Integral Mission Training Center. Um, can you go back and take a moment? Um, Apart from uh, teaching in the centre, their main task was to get to the point where it was self-supporting. And uh, have we achieved this? Next slide, please. They moved 500 miles uh, <coughs> and two plane journeys uh, to Truilla. Um, I have no idea whether that's how you pronounce it. My Spanish is incredibly limited, second only to my French and third only to my English. Um, <laughs> which is on the northwest coast of Peru, as you can see it there. Um, they still go back and forth to Iquitos occasionally, um, but, not, but fairly rarely because of the difficulty of travel. So next slide, please. In Truillo, Dave and Michelle run the Truillo Bible Seminary, um, where they're officially referred to as professors. Um, and their focus is much as it was before on training and building up church leaders. Uh, Truro is much better connected as a city than the Quitos, and the children now 13, 10, and 8 uh, attend their first proper school, which uh, is the local international school. Um, in the seminary, technically, Dave is in charge. Um, gender equality and women in ministry are not big in Peruvian church service. Um, Dave is now studying for his master's degree, and um, WBC was recently able to help out a little bit with his fees. Um, Michelle already has her master's from some years ago, and a very good dissertation it was. I got the second market. So there you are. Uh, next slide, please. The Marm family are BMS Link missionaries. Actually, the family are in the UK at the moment over Christmas and have a hugely busy schedule organised for them by BMS. However, on the 30th of um, December, we managed to squeeze in a lunchtime stop on their way from Maidstone to Chard. Um, and we were able to spend a couple of hours eating and chatting together and getting a sense of their ongoing calling and commitment to work in Peru, as well as the scale of some of the issues that they face. So, what do you need to do now? Well, please pray for them. There are bookmarks on your, some of the seats this morning. I've got a few spares. Um, please feel free to take them away, pop them in your Bible, or whatever book you happen to be reading at the moment. Um, Dave and Michelle produce uh, an updated prayer letter every couple of months, <coughs> the last one being in December. And I will make sure that there's a link to this that pops up on um, church Facebook. But you can also follow the link to their BMS page if you're into this sort of thing using the QR code on the mission board down at the bottom of the stairs. 
and there's also a link to their BMS page from uh, Winchester Baptist Church's website, International Mission Page. I'm excited. So, um, prayer points, and these pick up on some of the ones that are listed on the card. Um, please pray for the strength of Dave and Michelle's witness, um, which we found, uh, well, I found, I haven't talked with anybody else actually, but I'm assuming nobody complained, um, I found a very powerful and a very powerful story, actually. Um, please pray for Jonathan Phoebe and Ruth to fry, it's not always difficult, and not always easy for missionary kids. And the international school is good, but Jonathan particularly has had a few struggles as he <coughs> tends to stand up to bullies, um, which is not something in homeschooling they had previously encountered. Um, please pray for greater unity among the churches. This is serious. Churches in Peru very definitely do not work across denominational um, boundaries. And um, lastly, for alleviation of poverty. Um, Peru, not, not unlike in some ways our own country, has very rich and very, very poor. Um, so it has significant issues of poverty. And those are all mentioned on the bookmark. So um, if it's okay with you, I'd like us just to take a moment now to pray quietly for them. The bookmarks are there to remind you. Um, pick a topic or two, or even all four if you're quick. Um, and we'll pray quietly for a moment for the Martin's family and their work. And then I will wrap it up in a moment with um, a prayer. Um, when we met Michelle, her comment to me afterwards as we were walking back to her car was that they could feel the love of God oozing out us. <coughs> I think that was a compliment. Um, but in their recent prayer letter, they say, we pray for you as you enter 2024. May you stay full of hope and confidence in Jesus and rejoice in God's goodness for us. So, using the bookmark, let's take a moment and pray quietly and I will draw our prayers together in a moment or two. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the, uh, the faithful journey of calling that you, that the Marm family have been on. Thank you for the way that you have led them and guided them over the last few years. And we'll pray for more of that. We pray that they would know where they should be at all times, Lord, that uh, in all that they're doing uh, this in the seminary, Lord, that they would be effective and that their teaching would uh, be um, the, the quality that is needed for each of these students. And we'll pray for each of those students as well, Lord, that they would uh, complete their studies well and go on to be um, leaders in the church in Peru. Dear Father, I just pray for Jonathan, a young man who feels very strongly about what's right and wrong and yet sometimes perhaps doesn't feel and understand the uh, context of stepping out. Just give him real wisdom for some, someone of such young age and real knowing how to be a witness for you in, that, in the situations he finds himself. Heavenly Father, we thank you for BMS World Mission. As they seek to bring people to faith and help them experience the abundant life that 
you can provide. We thank you for the many lives that have already been transformed by you through BMS over the last years and for this opportunity for us to be part of their work. We pray that you will strengthen Dave and Michelle as they serve and teach and reach out to some of the most marginalised and least evangelised people in the world. Help them provide hope to the hopeless through their church, education, health, justice, relief and leadership ministries. May their actions be inspired by the values of love, integrity, faith and excellence. Guide and encourage them and bless the lives of those that they are loving and supporting. And we especially pray for Jonathan, Phoebe and Ruth that along with their mum and dad, they may flourish and grow. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is from the letter of James, beginning 
chapter 1, verse 1. I'm reading from the um, New Revised Standard Version. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God, who gives, all, gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given. But ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter, being double-minded and unstable in every way, must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Let the believer who is lowly boast in being raised up, and the rich in being brought low. Because the rich will disappear like a flower in the field, for the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the field. Its flowers falls, flower falls, and its beauty perishes. It is the same with the rich. In the midst of a busy life, they will wither away. Blessed is anyone who endures temptation. Such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. No one, when tempted, should say, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Then when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my beloved. Every generous act of giving, with every perfect gift, is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfilment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is the word of God.
pray. Father God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Over the next few months, we're going to be exploring a sermon series of the book of James, a small New Testament book. It has a flavour all of its own. It's deeply practical and spiritual, down to earth. But over the years, some famous Christians have had cause for concern with the book of James. And even today, some Christians see James as a second-rate book in the New Testament. It's not often somebody's favourite New Testament letter or book. Uh, the famous William Tyndale, whose name you'll recognise from uh, translating uh, the Bible for us into English, um, I mean, his translation work was phenomenal. Um, some people are estimating that, that the New Testament that we find in the King James Version, um, 83% of Tyndale's work, the New Testament part of that, 83% of that New Testament is William Tyndale's work in the King James. In the Old Testament, 76% of the Old Testament was his work. But Tyndale left the book of James till the end to translate because he didn't rate it highly. So Tyndale didn't have a, a high view of the book of James. Martin Luther, one of the Reformation's great movers and shakers, uh, also regarded it as a second-rate book alongside Tyndale. Uh, along with, not just James, but he said that Jude and Hebrews also, and even Revelation, he put down as a second-rate book. Some of us might agree with that, just because we don't understand Revelation, but there you go. Luther famously said of the book of James, and I quote, The Gospel and the first epistle of St. John, St. Paul's epistles and St. Peter's first epistle, are the books which show Christ to you. They teach everything you need to know for your salvation, even if you were never to see or hear any other book or teaching. In comparison to these, the epistle of James is an epistle full of straw, because it contains nothing evangelical. Harsh words for a book of the New Testament, aren't they? But sometimes it's just satisfying to know that perhaps even people as good as Tyndale and Luther got things wrong. Perhaps allowing their personal preferences to get in the way of sound judgment. Now, some New Testament commentators today liken James to one of the Old Testament minor prophets with his passion for his own people. He references in his opening address that this letter is to the 12 tribes scattered amongst the nations. This is to go out to, to the Jewish church who've come to understand Jesus as the Messiah. He longs for his own people to come to a full understanding of true faith. And alongside that, we see his practical and pastoral care throughout the letter. And there's a real sense of encouragement that comes through the book, along with a few healthy rebukes along the way. But the book has a lasting relevance for each generation, and we don't need to draw too much away from it to find out its application today. James, a servant of God, is how he starts his letter. Most of us, as Christians, when we get up in the morning, we'll spend some time in prayer and reading and commitment to God. We may even confess to God our knowledge of his claim upon our lives. But I wonder how many of us are happy to confess to others that we are servants of God. Do you put that in your cards, and your letters, if you still send letters indeed? Email would be the modern letter, wouldn't it? Do you start your emails with, so and so, a servant of God and of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Could you please deal with this form as quickly as possible? <laughs> you don't do it. We don't talk about trying our best to obey God's commands or his will. And we need to keep in our minds that when this letter was written, slavery was very real. And slavery then meant a legal obligation to do as your master bids you to do. So if you're a slave in a household and your master said, tomorrow morning I want you to be up before everyone else and I want you to go and clean out the, the pig pan, you would have to do that. It's a very real commitment. And this is what <coughs> Jones is drawing out here. That actually, I will do what God is asking me to do because I consider myself his servant, his slave. It begs the question, doesn't it, how quick are we today to obey God's call on our lives each and every day? If we feel God asking us to do something, do we just go and do it without asking? A slave would never have second questioned or second guessed their master. 
Are you sure you want the pig pen cleaning out that early? So you do it. You just go and you do as you're told. And this is what James is getting across here, that he does what he feels God is asking him to do. There's a challenge for us there. How quickly do we do that without questioning? Furthermore, when we acknowledge before others who our master is, so if people know that we're Christians, they will expect certain things of us. For good or bad, depending on what their expectation or what their experience of Christians and church is like. They might expect a sense of godliness from their lives. Kindness, patience, love, mercy, wisdom. It's no small thing to say that we are followers of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is our Lord and Saviour, we are his servants. Because it carries with it an expectation from other people of how our lives will be lived out as followers of Jesus. Remember that James here is writing to his own people, the 12 tribes of Israel. Therefore, this opening statement of his letter is a bold one to make, for he is also in his very first sentence equating being a servant of God with being a servant of Jesus Christ as being one and the same thing. The very thing that the religious experts had struggled to understand and accept that here in Jesus Christ is the Messiah, James says quite boldly in the beginning of this letter, a servant of God and of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. It's bold enough to put his head up above the religious parable. And then we go on to the section entitled Trials and Temptations. Having introduced himself and letting his readers know whom he serves, James gets right into the thick of it, verses 2 to 8. And I wonder, well, I don't wonder, I know that you will have had these days, weeks, months, or even years, when you ask yourself, what, what have I done to deserve this? All of us at some point had those days where we think, what have I done that this has landed on my doorstep, or that I'm experiencing this right now? And James knew that there were things that happen in this life that make us think about cause and consequence. What was the cause of this situation? And is this present trial the consequence of a former action? What have I done that's brought this upon us? And James also knew that from time to time, bad things can happen through no fault of our own. Maybe it's someone else's fault from time to time, or maybe it's just how life is. Life happens, things get messy. And so James' first practical application for a follower of Christ is to nurture and to exercise an attitude of joy no matter what. No matter what. The times I've heard brothers and sisters in Christ share about how they've been let down by other people. And some of them have been let down in serious ways, in serious situations. There's one Dear faithful lady in the Lord, you may remember, none of you here will know it was a different church. Um, but she shared with me one time how a doctor had failed to contact another doctor and left it weeks and weeks and weeks before passing on some vital information for this lady's diagnosis and subsequent tre treatment. And this, this delay had few consequences for her. And the doctor was very apologetic with her. And she was very gracious to the doctor. She said to the doctor, it's okay. Even doctors are not perfect. You make mistakes. That mistake cost her months of her life. And she said, it's fine. She said, I praise God because he, he's in control. He knew this was going to happen. And therefore, he will give me the strength to face whatever happens as a result of this. And I thought, wow. Wow. I might have been thinking, seeking legal advice. What would you have thought? How would you have felt? Then there was a friend from Bristol, Bristol Baptist College who we trained for ministry at the same time, the same age as myself, had a real pastoral heart and an astute theological mind. And on his 40th birthday, which was the same year as my 40th birthday, he was in hospice with weeks left to live. And we went to visit him, myself and another student, um, who were students, we then ministered. Um, we visited him and he was saying how some people from his church, well-meaning Christians, had come to visit with him and share with him that he was not going to die. 
God will save you. You just have to trust him. And he graciously listened to them and he allowed them to lay hands and pray, on, pray for him. Um, and afterwards he said that you know, they feel that this is genuine and that this is from God. So who am I to say that they shouldn't do this? But whether they're right or whether the doctors are right, praise God. Because God is being witnessed to through all of this. And again I thought, wow. And I look around the church this morning. And I can see people here this morning who've been through, you've been through your own trials and tribulations and you've got similar stories to tell about how in the midst of it you may not have felt very joyful but you gave thanks to God and that's what James is inviting us to enter into. That no matter what life throws at us we will continually give thanks to God in some manner of joy. It doesn't mean we have to be screaming hallelujah, I'm so happy and clappy. But it may just be, praise God, he's in control. Expression of joy. One of the things that James is saying here is it's not just to nurture and practice that attitude of joy no matter what. He's also, he's assuring us that we will face times of trials as Christians. We will face difficult times in life. He's definitely about it. Being a Christian brings difficulties of all sorts. It doesn't take us out of the difficulties of life. No one ever said being a Christian was going to be easy. Jesus didn't say that, did he? Otherwise he wouldn't have said, pick up your cross and follow me. We've probably all seen throughout our lives people who have faced financial difficulties. Or people who are financially comfortable but then comes along an illness that no amount of money can solve. Seeing people go through employment difficulties, family crisis, parents facing hard choices with children and children facing hard choices with parents. Christians at odds with one another. No one said it would ever be easy. It will not be easy and we will face times of trial and temptation. But consider it pure joy, says James, because it tests your faith, and such testing produces perseverance. And if there is something that we need as Christians, it is perseverance and endurance. And if you want that, it only comes through one thing, through facing difficult times and trusting God in the midst of those difficult times. That's where the perseverance and the endurance comes from. Now I just want to say that Whatever you're facing today in life, God is with you in the midst of it. You may be sat here this morning not feeling very joyful or hopeful because of what you're facing, but God is in the midst of it with you. And he is in control even if we do not understand why or how. And I've said it from here before and no doubt it will be said again, we learn most through our times of trials in life. It is in the shadow of the valley that our faith is forged and tested for what it is. This is where we are grown into mature believers, lacking in nothing, says James. But then he goes on to say, if we lack wisdom, we should ask God who gives generously, if we lack wisdom. And the Greek word translated if, in verse 5, it, it's not all that iffy. Bear with me, you'll get what I mean by that. It's an if that isn't iffy. Um, it's a first class condition, is the term for it in Greek. Now, this doesn't mean it's a perfect specimen of a Greek if, but rather it's assuming that which it's stating to be true. We all lack wisdom at some point in life. Even the wisest person alive, as soon as they say the words, I lack no wisdom, haha, you lack wisdom. You just said it. All of us at some point will lack wisdom. It's easy to be wise or know what to do when things are going well. The difficulty comes when the pressure is on. When adversity strikes. When temptation pulls. When sin crouches at our door and when Satan seeks to sift us. That is precisely when we need God's wisdom. 
And James says, ask and it will be given to you. But ask with faith. Do not waver in your belief. Do not be double-minded, is what he says in verse 8. We must have a confident faith and belief in God that works for the good of those who love him. We must not allow ourselves to be like the waves of the sea, at the mercy of the winds of change. One day they seem to move in one direction, the next they move in the opposite. This must not be our approach to God in prayer. And James's use of this word double-minded only occurs twice in the New Testament, both in the book of James, uh, chapter 1, verse 8, and chapter 4, verse 8. And it literally means, do not be double-souled. <coughs> Do not be double souled. And it's describing the plight of one whose soul is caught between faith and the world, the spiritual and the material. In James's letter, it describes a mind distracted by lusts and temptations, an idea epitomised by John Bunyan's character, Mr. Facing Both Ways. Remember Mr. Facing Both Ways? Also captured very well in Augustine's prayer. O oh Lord, grant me purity, but not yet. Very honest prayer, but that's a double-souled prayer. I want it, just not yet, later. James says, don't be like that. Be wholly committed to it. Believe it with all your strength, soul and might, and trust God for it. We must come to God in times of trial with an attitude of joy, for we know that our faith is being perfected. But we must also come seeking wisdom in order to persevere. Come with that absolute faith that God will hear your prayer and grant us wisdom as we seek Him and keep, keep on persevering through the trials and temptations that come our way. Much of life's trials and temptations can be seen as a simple dichotomy of whether we have enough or whether we have too little, rich or poor. How many times have you heard someone say, oh, if only I'd win the lottery? Yeah, I've said it myself. I have to buy a ticket to win it, but there you go. There's that feeling out in the world that if we had enough of whatever it is, money, power, recognition, all would be well. <coughs> You don't have to look too far to find people who've got more than enough and all is not well. And the popular Jewish belief of James' time was not too dissimilar to some of the distorted views of the Christian faith today. In that if someone had good social standing, they were considered blessed and favoured by God for their pious life. If they've got everything, if they've got, in today's terms, the house, the car, the holidays, the family, then they must have a really righteous kind of life. That was the kind of belief during James' time. Yet those who were less fortunate were regarded as having punishment from on high for some unknown or unseen sin that they must be guilty of. Otherwise, why would their life be so bad? Simply put, the pious were to prosper and the sinners were to suffer. So for the poor, James is saying, take pride in your high position. One day, you will inherit everything is what James says. Those of you who have nothing, you're in a, you're in a high position because one day it will all be yours. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God, says Jesus. For the rich, James says, take pride in your low position because one day you will lose everything that you currently have to inherit the eternal kingdom. But in the economy of God, both rich and poor who trust in Christ will both be heirs in God's kingdom. And this fact perhaps should cause those who are perceived as being blessed in this life to share with those who are not so blessed. If rich and poor alike will receive the same reward in eternity, then why not share the same blessings in the short span of time that we have here on earth? If, if you're rich and you're going to lose it anyway, then start losing it now and sharing it and enjoying some more time with other people. Spiritual maturity does not come through being comfortable in this life. The poor are never comfortable in worldly terms. So they have a head start in some ways 
And the rich should always keep in mind that their comfort is no guarantee of spiritual maturity. Both rich and poor alike need to ensure that they have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And rich and poor alike both need to persevere through the trials of life. When trials of all kinds come to our door and barge through like an intruder in the night. Now that's often how it happens, isn't it? Life seems to be going well and then that phone call, that letter on the doormat, that knock on the door, that dawning realisation that, oh, all is not well. And it is at those times we are most susceptible to allow ourselves perhaps to find excuses sinful behaviour. Maybe we feel that times of stress somehow justify responding in the wrong way and that we can be excused for it. There is no excuse for sinful behaviour. We must not fall into the trap of naming and blaming God for our actions, says James. God does not tempt us. God cannot tempt us because God himself cannot be tempted. And the reason God cannot be tempted is because there is no sin within God that can respond to temptation. Temptation seeks to draw out what is already there. Go back and read Mark chapter 7, verses 14 to 23. See what Jesus has to say about that. And there's this false logic that leads to blaming God, and it goes something along these lines. God is in control of all things. Therefore, God has brought adversity into my life. And in times of adversity, I'm often tempted to act in a sinful way. Therefore, God is the source of my being tested in temptation. I don't want to say that's false logic. And go back to these phrases. God is in control of all things. Yes, God is in control of all things. Therefore, God has brought adversity into my life. No. Human rebellion brought adversity into life. Go back and read Genesis chapter 3 to find out the story. And God asks us, because of that, to deal with the consequences of our own doing. We brought adversity into our own lives as humanity. In times of adversity, we're often tempted to act in a single way. Yes, that may well be true. But the therefore God is the source of my temptation. No, the source of our temptation is sinfulness within the human heart. We've opened the door to that, not God. And God has given us a way to overcome that through Jesus Christ and the gift of his Holy Spirit. We must take responsibility for our own sinful desires and the way in which we react to the adversities that come into our lives. We will all suffer. We will all face trials and temptations. But James's question is this. Will we allow our suffering to be redemptive or destructive? Have an attitude of joy in your trials will be seen as a means of perfecting your faith. But if we complain and we blame God, then we fall into a very dangerous trap. <coughs> Finally, James tells us that God is the God of all good and perfect gifts. God has given gift, good gifts to all humanity for all humanity. God is not double-minded, double-souled. God wills only one thing. Therefore, there is purity of heart within God. And where there is purity, there can be no evil, no bad gift, no temptation which leads to sin, which in turn leads to death. Instead, there is life in abundance within God. New life offered through a God who is constant and unchanging. A new life that comes to us through the word of truth. The good news of Jesus Christ. Will we choose to take hold of that good and perfect gift that God has given? Because our new birth into God's kingdom comes through accepting Jesus Christ. Those who enter the new birth in Christ, whether they're rich or poor, whether they're going through trials and temptations or having an easy time of it, will inherit the kingdom of God. They will inherit a gift far greater than anything this world has to offer, says James. We're not even at the end of James chapter 1, but all of a sudden, to me, James does not seem so full of straw 
after all. Let us pray. Father of lights, from whom comes every good and perfect gift, hear our prayers which we offer to you this morning. We pray for the church, that we might show forth our faith in action, that we may regard all with impartiality, being quick to listen and slow to anger. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, that whenever trials may befall us, that God may grant us endurance and wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. We pray for the world, that the lowly may be raised up, that the proud would be laid low, and that mercy may fall on us all. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We pray for the sick, the injured, the vulnerable, and those undergoing all forms of adversity, bringing before you now in silence those whom we know personally. Father, we pray that they might all be raised up, that in the midst of their trials they may know your love, your presence, and your grace. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Gracious God, let our prayers be offered to you with the gentleness that is born from your wisdom from above, that is pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, and full of mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
refreshments will be served through the link, but before we go, let us share in the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all.